This morning I want to bring you a message uh, entitled Keys to Successful Parenting. And uh, whether you are a, a, a father, it's directed specially to fathers, although there is going to be some application to moms, there's parts. Uh, but I just want to say to you, uh, whoever you are, father, mother, sister, brother, make some notes. You may not, this, you may not be a note taker. I encourage you to do, to do so because I bet you along the line you're going to run into somebody who you can help. Amen? You know, sometimes it's not just about us. Sometimes it's about somebody God puts in our pathway that we can help. And some of you are younger. You haven't started on that journey to parenting yet. But might God prepare you. One of the sad things is that many of us became parents with no training. Um, but might God help you to be prepared from some of the things we're going to share. And uh, uh, you know, I'm just the messenger. Not everything I'm going to say is going to make you want to jump up and shout, amen? But just know I'm just the messenger giving you what God has laid on my heart. Father, help us now that as we open your word, it might be meaningful, it might be edifying, it might be practical and helpful to someone. And we ask for the help of your spirit in Jesus' name, amen. The journey home of the Pacific Salmon is one of nature's most exciting dramas. The Pacific Salmon is born in freshwater rivers or streams. And these freshwater rivers will eventually dump them into the ocean. They stay in the ocean probably five or six years. And during those five or six years, the Pacific Salmon will cover a thousand or two thousand miles from the river where they were hatched. But somewhere about five years in the ocean, the Pacific salmon decides to come home. Amazingly, although they may be a thousand or two thousand miles away from where they were born, these salmon are able to bypass every river and every stream and a thousand or two thousand miles away, they are able to locate the exact river where they were born. Amazingly, the minute they hit the river of origin, they stop eating. And using stored energy, the Pacific salmon is able to swim upstream about 30 miles per day until he gets to exactly where in the river he was born. Cheryl and I were in a park in Alaska some years ago watching, trying to get a view of the Pacific salmon coming home. But there was only one problem. There were some big signs in the park and the sign said, Caution! Bears! Immediately my wife seemed very perturbed. I was perturbed but I wasn't showing it because I had to look like the macho man. And so she said, let's go. I said, why are we going? She said, because they are beers. I said, honey, they taught us what to do if we run into a beer. I said, they taught us that if you run into a beer, you stand on the tippy toes and you hold your hand up as high as you can and you try to make yourself as tall as you can. And once the beer sees how tall you are, the beer is going to turn around and run. And so she said to me, suppose the bear wasn't told he's supposed to run. What are we going to do? Well, I didn't really have an answer for that possibility. Although, to be honest, when they gave us this teaching, I was a little suspicious of the training myself. So we decided we'd walk away. But you know, we eventually found a spot that was safe and where the Pacific salmon was on their last leg home. And I tell you, it was dramatic. These salmon, they were continuously launching themselves upstream, constantly jumping out the water and launching themselves upstream as they tried to make it home. But do you know as soon as the salmon got home, as soon as they got to the spot in the river where they were hatched, where they were spotted, the the female lays her egg. The male fertilizes the egg. And soon after, they both die. They had come home. 
and they had continued the circle of life. Scientists are still trying to figure out how in the world can a salmon travel over a thousand miles from the river and not only find the river of origin, but find the spot in the river where they were born. The, the scientists haven't figured that out. But wouldn't it be great if you and I could find a way to make sure that no matter how far our children traveled and strayed, they would always come home. Now I know some of you are clapping while others are saying, Pastor, the one thing I don't want is for them to come home. <laughs> Pastor, you don't know how hard it was for me to get them out. The last thing I want is for them to come back home. But I wasn't really thinking about coming home physically while they're alive or when they died. I was really thinking about, wouldn't it be great if somehow the values we plant in our children, that no matter what happened in their lives, they would eventually come back to these values that we planted in them. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Is that really true? You know, some, some sociologist from Harvard University by the name of Gluck, years ago, many years ago, many, many years ago, they did some research. And these sociologists came to realize that there are four very important conditions that if these conditions are found in any family, if they took a sample that of children five or six years old whose family exhibited these conditions in their home, they found that every sample they did, over 90% of those children always were ended up being well-adjusted children who did not shame their parents or exhibit any antisocial behavior. Did you hear what I said? They were able, the Glocks were able to take children and then when, when it was believed that this could not apply in the inner city, they took a sample, they, uh, they went to Washington, D.C., into one of the toughest neighborhoods, and the school system sent them 190-something kids, the most troubled children, five or six years old. Because, you see, the beauty is, even if the kid is acting up when they're young, like me, you see, they're saying, if the family dynamics, if there are certain four critical factors, they're saying, that 90% or, or more of those children will end up not developing antisocial or delinquent behaviors. What are those four qualities? What are those four factors? The interesting thing, which makes me even want to talk about them, is because they only discovered something that the Bible had already said. You see, all four things that they brought to the fore are things that the Bible actually already taught us. And so this morning, I want to use some of their study. I want to share with you the four things they shared from a biblical context. Amen? As I bring you this message entitled, Keys to Successful Parenting. Key number one, the Father's Discipline. Key number one, the father's discipline. The study found that a father taking responsibility for discipline in his home is a key predictor, is one of the predictors of the future behavior of his children. I don't want him to miss that. A father, listen, fathers should assume leadership for discipline in their home. 
You know, in that passage we read this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you so we can all see it in the same version. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. God says, fathers, make sure to bring up your children with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. A father's role in discipline is very important. Now, don't get me wrong. Mom's role is very important too. The ideal is for both mom and dad to be working together to discipline their children. Amen? But there is something special about a father's discipline. You see, at home, we, I only had two brothers. You know, you know one very well. The other one you see from time to time. He was here a few weeks ago. We are the three boys. And let's be honest. If you ask him, he'll admit, agree with me. Mom would discipline us. But it was sort of weak. It was sort of light. Can I be honest? It was, a f it was no big deal. But when my dad disciplined us, that was a different story. I remember I feared my dad's discipline so much that one day as he was about to come down and give me a whipping, I ran out the room, I ran out the house, I ran out the yard, I ran up the street. And my dad, he calmly came to the, to the gate and he called to me and he said, don't worry, you'll eventually have to come home. <laughs> and he said, and I'll be waiting. <laughs> and you see, my dad was like some of us dads because part of the problem with child rearing today is that parents promise to do something, they promise to discipline, but they don't ever carry it out. Am I right about that? But you see, my dad was a man of his word. If he told you he was going to give you an allowance, you got the money. If he told you he was going to discipline you, and there he was waiting for me. And I got my job. He did a job on me. Amen. But I thank God for my dad. Because were it not for his firm hand and his discipline, he eventually broke a rebellious streak in me. That's for another day to hear some of my, my stuff. But God, had, my father had to take. Control. And I want to ask you fathers, you know, our society has, has had a role reversal. And more and more, the mothers are doing all the discipline. And, and sometimes, to be honest, some moms don't even want dad to discipline. But that's not God's way. And this, the studies have indicated that this actually, a father in his involvement in discipline actually is very impactful on the child and I want to encourage you young fathers in particular those who are fathers now and those who will become fathers listen don't miss that responsibility but listen it's easy for us to talk about discipline but I don't want you to miss something because the same scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 verse number 4 that talks about disciplining and the father's responsibility it also gives us a warning I don't want you to miss it because Ephesians 6 verse 4 says and you fathers do not provoke your children to do not provoke your children to anger Listen, this is important. Listen, this is important. Fathers should avoid aggravating their children. You see, the same thing is repeated very similar. Something very similar is repeated in Colossians chapter 3 verse 21 where the Bible tells us fathers don't provoke your children to anger lest they be discouraged. Some Bible versions put it this way. It says fathers do not aggravate your children or they will be discouraged. So the Bible is saying that fathers need to take responsibility for leadership, but it is also warning fathers not to aggravate them. Dad, the fact that God specifically tells us twice, it tells me that God is saying that men, fathers are more likely to aggravate their children than mothers are. 
Fathers are more likely to provoke their children to anger. And daddy, make sure you seize your responsibility. But dad, as you seize the responsibility, God is warning you, caution, caution, caution. You had better do it responsibly and carefully, lest you go to the other extreme. So let me share with you very quickly two ways to provoke your children to anger. Number one, one way to, to provoke them into anger is by unfair or abusive discipline. I did my share of unfair discipline. I'd get involved, I'd hear what something is going on, and without even finding all the facts, I just figure sin is involved. Let me discipline everybody. And so I had, to, I had to go and apologize to the children. Because you see, when God finishes saying, but what you did was not right. And parents, don't be afraid to apologize to your children when you realize you were wrong. Do you do any apologizing? Or do you take this high and mighty position? I am the father. I am the mother. I am the dad. I can do whatever I want to do. No, no, no. When you are wrong, when you have done something to aggravate that child because you were on fear, you need to apologize. That goes a much further way than you might think. I am telling you from experience. You might be shocked to know what happens when you go to your child and tell them daddy was wrong in what he did. But don't be unfair, but don't be abusive. But that's a subject all by itself. And I'm going to suggest to you, if you're not sure how far to go, listen, there are some great websites out there. One, Focus on the Family, has a lot of material about how to discipline your child. Hey, you can go on and look around. But number one, unfair or abusive discipline. But another way, there are more ways, but another one is to, by thoughtless words. You know, when we were kids, you ever heard them say, sticks and stones may break my bones you see if you're brazilian you if you speak portuguese you might not have heard that expression that's all right they say sticks and stones may break my bones but your words cannot harm me is a lie words hurt words hurt and the problem is that years later, that child remembers the word, the hurtful, damaging words you said. And so God says, listen, don't provoke your children to anger. Be very careful with the words you say. And here are five words not to say. Number one, nothing. Okay, you say, Pastor, that's not a word. Here's what I'm trying to say. In case you miss it. There are some fathers who absolutely say nothing. If the child does something good, they say. If the child does something bad, they say. They say nothing. That, that ain't good. That ain't good. Don't be, don't be a, like a bump on a log. But secondly, dad... Don't ever give the impression or say, I don't believe in you. And the third is similar to, I don't believe in you. The third is, you're such a disappointment. Do parents do that? Now, some parents won't actually say, you are such a disappointment. But they'll say, I'm very disapp I'm disappointed in what you did. You see, it's okay to be disappointed in an action the child took. But here's the problem. If all you are is disappointed in actions, come with me now. If you never ever say what you are proud about and what you are pleased about, if all you pick at are the things you are disappointed about, that child is going to interpret your saying that you are disappointed in me. Because listen, if you can never make a deposit into the child's self-esteem account, be careful that all you're doing are making withdrawals. 
And so God wants us to be very careful. We provoke our children to anger when we convey, either because we actually say it or because oh, we are always disappointed in everything. God says, don't provoke that child to anger. But here's the big one. Here's, you ready for the big one, number four? Why can't you be like your sibling? Why can't you be like... Anybody ever say, You ever heard anybody say that? Why can't you be like your sister? Why can't you be like your brother? And I tell you, once you say that, a dagger goes through the child's heart. A dagger. You know, here's the funny thing. Most parents who do that, they mean well because they think they are motivating the child. Do you realize that? They're trying to motivate the child because they're seeing this child doing so well and they're hoping that when I say that to you, I'm going to motivate you. Parent, I'm going to tell you it does not work because what you end up doing is comparing me with somebody else and you are saying he is better than I am and it is a totally kill joy. It is the worst thing you can do. And I'm going to ask you, my friend, if you're a parent, you got to fix some of those things. Don't start comparing your child with some other sibling. These things are counterproductive. And then finally, as I talk about these five things not to say to your children, don't say anything negative about their mother. Well, you know, sometimes we got a fight going on and I want to hit the guy on my side. I want little Jimmy on my side. And I tell little Jimmy some bad things about mom. You know, this is particularly true when mom and dad may be separated or whatever. Listen, even if you're separated, don't say anything bad about mom. Amen? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Number one, father should assume leadership for discipline. But secondly, the mother's supervision the research showed that a mother's supervision was also very, very important. You see, what they found out, that mothers need to be so active in their child's life that she always knows where her child is. Are you with me? Mom needs to be so involved with her child that she always knows where her child is. She is supervising the child even when the child is not in her presence. She knows what he, where he is. She knows what he or she is up to or supposed to be up to. Amen? What does the Bible have to say about this? Turn with me, if you would, to Titus chapter to Titus chapter. Two. Titus chapter 2. And I'm going to read from you, that, to read from Titus chapter 2, just a couple verses there in verses 3 to 5. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. And the Apostle Paul, in the first couple of verses, he speaks to the men and the older men. And now here in verse 3, he says to the older women, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands. By the way, this is not for today's message, but ladies, don't miss that. Older women, don't miss. There ought to be a connection between the older woman and the younger woman. Don't take the position that they don't want me in my, their business, so I'm not going to be involved, because my Bible says that the older women are to admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. The unchangeable word of God is telling us something. And the unchangeable word of God is saying to a mom and to a wife, listen, you ought to be loving your husband. You ought to be taking care of your husband. You ought to be taking care of your children. Hey, you ought to be taking care of your home. Now, some people don't like these verses. And they will say, you know, these verses are trying to deny women the right to work out of the home. But they're wrong. Because these verses are not denying anybody any rights. 
These verses are not about your rights, it's about responsibilities. And what these verses are saying, that no matter what a mom might decide to do, she has certain responsibilities to her family. Listen, men has responsibilities, women has, have responsibilities, and God says, because of the responsibilities, as we study the scripture, because of the responsibilities he has given a mom in the home, he has also given mom special abilities that no one else can do as well as a mother can. Oh, you should, that was worth an amen. <laughs> because I am here to say to you that while our world is having us concentrate so much on women trying to make sure that they have the right to do anything a man can do, Somehow we have lost focus on the fact that God has given women the ability to do something that no man can do. And God has given you the ability to do things that nobody can do as well as you can. So if you want to do everything I can, help yourself. All God is saying, make sure you don't lose sight of the things that only you can do. And you can do better than anybody else. The society wants you to forget it. And what I'm saying is not politically correct. But God does not care what is politically correct. God says it like it is. And the reality our society does not seem to be doing so well. The further we have gone from rejecting the scriptures. Am I right about that? The further we have gotten from rejecting the scripture. And we say we don't want our children learning this holy scripture. The further we get, the more it seems like our society is unraveling. Until today, our children don't even know who they are. And God is saying to you mommies, oh, don't worry, I'm not going to preach to mom because this is a Father's Day message, so I'm about to leave you. <laughs> but God is saying to you mommy, don't ever forget that there is nobody who could nurture and supervise your child the way you can. He has specially equipped you for it. Seize the opportunity. Hallelujah. Number one, the father's discipline. Number two, a mother's supervision. Number three, parental affection. Children thrive on their parents' affection for them. Did you know that? I was counseling a family trying to encourage the dad. And the dad said to me, my kids ought to know that I love them because I work so hard. He says, I work hard and I have provided for my children, for their education, for their home. I provide everything for my child. And he said, they ought to realize I love them. He said, I love them. But if they're waiting for me to tell them I love them. He said, they're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> Is that how you feel? I said, I said, come on, man. You can, you can say it verbally. He says, if you ever knew what my father was like, I have come so far from what my father was. I don't need to be telling them. Have you told your son, dad, have you told him you love him? Have you told your daughter you love her? Have you told them how proud you are of them? How thankful you are to God for giving them to you? Do they know? Have they ever had the, do they often get the chance to feel this nice cuddly feeling because they have their father's affection? Mom, you need to do it too, but I'm only talking to fathers because it's Father's Day. And can I be honest? We're, the, we're usually the culprit here. 
Fathers, we think it's not macho to say to this little child, I love you. Don't you like hearing somebody say they love you? It means a lot to your child. Children thrive. Children thrive on their parents' affection for them. But children thrive on their parents' affection for each other. Ha! Let's go back to Ephesians. You know, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. So I'm still calling this message one of my messages on this series. I, I, I will skip out when I get to these parts. Ephesians chapter 6. I won't have to preach on Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 anymore. But I will be preaching some more on Ephesians chapter 5 when we get there. Even though I'm referring to it now. But Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Therefore. Husbands what? Husbands what? Love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives. What? As their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself guys did you see that we are supposed to love our wives as much as we love ourselves that's a whole lot of loving and just in case you don't love yourself he says love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that is even more loving sacrificial love do you love your wife that way Oh, we're not going to do a survey this morning. But do you really love your wife that way? You see, it does our children a whole lot of good when they see mom and dad demonstrating affection for each other. You know, back in the day, parents said, Oh, the children should never see us showing any affection. What sort of crazy family is that? Your children never ever see you hug and kiss. What's up? Is that how you want it? The kids need to see affection. You know, the kids, they go to school, and, and some of them, they have friends whose marriages have been destroyed. Their parents have broken up, and they have to deal. These children are dealing with pain, and they share the pain with their, with their friends. Your child is, has been with friends whose parents have broken up, and they know what it's like. And some of your children worry, is this going to happen at my house? Am I telling you, is this a news flash for you? Did you realize that your kids actually have those sorts of thoughts? Are my parents going to split up? Particularly when you fuss and don't ever seem to make up. But when he comes home and that fuss, oh the fuss has to happen sometimes. But when they see you fussing and making up and coming back and embracing and loving each other and they see this affection, they recognize no, God has got my mom and dad together. And God is holding them together by the power of his hand. Amen. Your kids have a sense of security because of the demonstration of affection. How is it at your house? This is not a marriage message. Oh, I could go on so many tangents in this message. But I want to say to you guys, if things aren't good at home, get help. It actually matters to your children that you get help. You may say, oh, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to tough it out. I put myself in this mess. I may as well just survive. <laughs> Do you know we have seen some miracles in this church? You don't need to know what they are. But we've seen some marriage miracles. And God can do a miracle in your life, in your marriage, if you're willing. Now, more often than not, it's the, it's the guy who won't come. A few cases, it's a woman. 
But guys, I'm saying to you, if your marriage isn't working well, I encourage you to take the initiative to get it fixed. Because if you are willing to submit to God, chances are your wife would say, okay, I'll go for the counseling too. Usually we, am I right about it? We guys are usually the ones who say, I don't need nobody's help. I'm a man. I can manage my own business. So I'm going to encourage you guys, for the children's sake and for your own sake, get it right. Amen? Get it right. Listen. One, the father's discipline. Second, the mother's supervision. Three, parental affection. And here is the fourth one the study found was critical. These are the four. The family's cohesiveness. The family's cohesiveness. Children thrive in a family that does stuff together. Did you hear what I'm saying? Children thrive in a family who do things together, who spend time together. You know, in that same verse of Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4, it says, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see, as fathers, we have a responsibility to bring up our children in the instruction of the Lord. We're supposed to be teaching our children. And one of the ways we teach our children is formally. We sit them down, we have our family devotions. And you know, we've been pushing this for a while, and hopefully most of our families have started having regular family devotions. We even went to the trouble of ordering books so you can buy them right here to have family devotions because it's a big deal. I have a responsibility to bring up my children in the instruction of the Lord. And one of the ways I do that as they were younger is to have family devotions where I formally instruct them from Scripture. We have devotions. We go through the Bible. We comment. I can get their input. Hey, formal. But the reality is children learn more from informal instruction than from the formal instruction. As someone once said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. Children do better seeing the lesson than hearing the lesson. Are you with me? And the way we, the way we get the children to see the lesson is to spend time with our children. And I don't want you to miss what God did with the children of Israel back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So I'm going to have you to turn there as our last scripture for the day. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. It's a well-known verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. And here's what God said to them. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, are you seeing what God is saying? God is saying you are to teach, you are to instruct your children as you live life together with your children. It's not just a matter of sitting them down to have devotion. It's actually living life together with your children. It's informal. And I'm going to suggest to you that this is one of the biggest areas where Christians fail. Because many times we come back as Christians and we wonder what went wrong. I had all these wonderful devotions with my child. How could they have gone so far afield? I'm going to suggest one, one possible, one, this is just a possible, one of the possible reasons is because the teaching in the devotion was never reinforced by living together with these children. It is important that we live a life together. And I want to encourage some of you. By the way, if you notice this church, we are doing everything we can to encourage you. That's why we're starting to plan all these activities. 
parents, we want to see you. The Sunday school is planning activities. And the reason we're there doing that and having all these awards is hopefully they can get the parents to come. Now we'll take the parents, but the ideal is for you as daddy to come. I thank God for my dad. I thank God for my mom, but I thank God particularly for my dad. My dad eventually had a very successful, very successful in business. He was chief operating officer for an insurance company, was elder in a church. He was a very busy man. But I tell you, he would come home. He taught us dominoes. That's why you guys have a hard time beating me. <laughs> uh, but sometimes he would still have on his tie. And he would come out when we were younger. He would have on his tie and he would be on the lawn kicking soccer. Football, we call it. You know, it is your foot you're using. That's why we call it football. My Brazilians are saying thank you because <laughs> American football. I thought this was your hand. This is, <laughs> uh, let me leave that one alone. But you know, sometimes on a Saturday, he would say, let's, let's, let's go to the beach. Three and a half hours each way because sometimes he wants to go to a far away beach. We'd spend seven hours plus the time we we're at the beach just together. Can you imagine how much we were learning? He didn't think he was teaching. But you see, God's method is that you're learning more that way than just sitting me down. Because when you just sit me down, I really want to run. <laughs> after, kids, after about minutes of the volume, you know, they're, they're tuned you out. But while you're doing life together, they're learning so much. They're learning that God can be trusted. They're learning that God is faithful. They're learning that there's power in prayer because they're queued into the conversation. I told you one of the stories about how the car broke down and how God, my dad prayed and the miracle had happened. Yes, we learn a whole lot. We learn not to badmouth people. We learn that we should have a heart of compassion for those who are less fortunate than ourselves. We are learning, learning, learning while we are doing life together. And I want to say to my good friends, because I love you all, you know that. I'm going to say it anyhow. Although we're talking about a multi-ethnic church, but I'm going to talk to some folks who look like me. Do you mind? Just for a second. Guys, I am really troubled as to where you are. Where are we? You know, I go to so many things that don't have a ball. Are you with me? It is time, guys, to start doing things with your children that is not centered on a ball. It's okay to do the things with a ball, but it's time to do stuff. Listen, I don't know what your dream is. You think they're going to all become basketball stars or soccer stars or whatever star? I don't want to crush you, but not everybody is. But why not help our children to have a more diverse mind? Why not take them to these places where there is science? Why not take them to some of these places for the arts? Why not take them to some of these places so they can be exposed to, to some of the beauties of God's creation? Where are we? And I tell you guys, my wife and I sometimes we said, wow. There are 200 people here. All these men. And I'm like, where are my brothers? We have got to change. Guys, it's time for a change. Can I hear the guys say amen? It's time for a change. Yes, go where the ball is bouncing. But start taking to the, these kids to places where no ball is bouncing. Let their minds uh, dream. Let them explore. Who knows, there might be an incredible scientist in your family who if he's exposed to some, something in the scientific field, he may say, and you show some interest in it? Oh, you got to show some interest too. Don't just take them there and say, well, let's keep moving. I'm only here because Brother Brian said I should come. <laughs> you got 
to show some interest. Amen. You might be amazed what you might wake up some sleeping giant might awaken in this child. But listen, you are teaching stuff. You are teaching, teaching, teaching. So guys, how is it at your house? Perhaps somebody needs to have some change. I'm going to wrap the message up with point number five. You said, I thought you said there were only four. This is, the Jamaicans call this brata. This is an extra. And I believe this is the most important of all five. Key number five, a home with Christ at the center. You see, in Psalm 127, 1, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. You see, it's good to have kids that are well adjusted. They're not social, anti-social. They're not dysfunctional. They're not juvenile delinquents. But to be honest, I wasn't raising my kids just for that. I wanted God to touch my children. I wanted God to use my children. I wanted that when my children grow up, they would know God and love God. And I'm saying to you, my friend, that will not happen unless you decide that Christ is going to be the center of my home. And listen, he can't be the center of your home if he's not the center of your life. And let's be honest, there's some people here this morning, you're not even sure he lives in you. And this morning as we talk about parenting, in a few minutes I'm going to give you an opportunity to say, Lord Jesus I want to receive you. I'm going to ask you in a moment just to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward this morning. But I'm going to ask some of you this morning to say, God, I want you in my life. Some of you are already Christians, but the Lord is in the back seat. You know, they used to have a sign, God is my co-pilot. It is in people's car. He don't want to be no co-pilot. Because you're saying, I'm the pilot. You can sit beside me. No, God, you're not the pilot of my home. I want you to be my pilot. I hope you're going to do that. That you're going to say, God, I want Christ to be the center of my home. I close with a story. About 35 years ago, we attended an award ceremony for one of the leading insurance companies. The salesman of the year was called out. And the president of the company said, he said, this was 35 years ago. He said, our company paid Mr. So-and-so $8 million in commissions last year. Now, 35 years ago, $8 million was real money. It still is money today, but 35 years ago, it was real, real, real money. $8 million just from this company. How much did he make overall? We had no idea. So they gave him his award, and they asked him, did he want to say a few words? He went to the microphone and broke into tears. It got my attention. I was 35 years younger. I had young kids. This was our hero. We all wanted to be like this guy. And this guy has broken into tears. And he said to us, he says, you guys know, I have a home in Paris. I have a home in the Virgin Islands. I have a home in New York City. He says, and here I am. I've made all this money. But he says, I'm a lonely man. He said, not even one of my children would come to see me receive this award. He said, I've lost all my children. He said, you know, when I, was, when, the, when I was younger and the children were young, I was so focused on my career. He said, I never had time for them. Well, in the context of our message, he didn't have time to discipline. He didn't have time to be with them. He didn't have time to show affection bottom line he said I didn't have time for my children and he said no they don't have any time for me and he cried he cried when he composed himself he looked at us and he said I want to encourage you young parents don't let this happen to you he says I would give everything I have for a chance to be father again. 
some of you are sacrificing so much. You're chasing this and you're chasing that. And God is saying, don't lose sight of the best. And today, I hope if there's some dad, some mom, who will say to God, God, I want to do better. Will you help me? If you say that, he will.